Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Didn't the little kids do great? They, they did. Okay, here's the thing. We haven't gotten to have those little kids up here in a while, and so getting to introduce them, I saw them coming before you guys, and it really, like, it made my heart really, really happy to see them coming up. So yes. they were super cute. Yes. Let's give them another round of applause. They did do great. So you may have noticed, um, but today is a very special Sunday. Um, it looks a little bit different than normal. Um, Laura, tell us, why is today a special Sunday? Today is Next Gen Sunday, so as you walked in the church, you might have seen that our volunteers are a little bit younger than usual, and they were excited to help out today. Yes, uh, today is Next Gen Sunday. Uh, we here at Real Life on the Palouse, we believe that the next gen is just that, the next generation of the church. Um, they are next in line, and so that's what today is all about, um, but it also explains a little bit why we are up here and maybe not Pastor Josh or Pastor Adam like you may totally be used to, so. Yes. We value the next generation so much that we get to spend every day helping them and growing them in their faith. Um, in case you didn't know who we are, let us introduce ourselves. This is Logan Steinbach. He's in charge of the middle school and high school um, youth, and he's fun and engaging, and he asks the silliest questions like, what is your least favorite kitchen utensil? Okay, there... <laughs> If anybody's ever been in a small group with me, that's a question that I ask. But there's a reason for that. It's because no one ever gets asked what their least favorite, favorite kitchen utensil is, and it makes you think, and it shows who a person is, exactly. So, so what is your least favorite kitchen utensil? Um, okay, my least favorite kitchen utensil is the potato peeler, because whenever I'm peeling potatoes, I'm always worried that I'm going to get more than just the potato when I'm peeling. But that's not what today's about. That's not the point. So. Um, but that's who I am. Uh, but you may not know um, who this is. This is Laura Uhlencott. Uh, she is our children's pastor here at Real Life. Um, she is in charge of uh, uh, infants through elementary. She is kind. She is passionate. She is devoted. Um, and if I'm being totally honest with you guys, she's a little bit of a workaholic. <laughs> But Laura cares about the kids of this church so much that she devotes her time and her energy, so much so that she's willing to put up with people like me in order to uh, pour into the next generation. Um, we could not be more happy with the kids that we have here, whether they are uh, in infant care all the way up to high school. Um, but don't just hear it from us. Um, I believe we have a video to kind of yes. tee up life for kids. So go ahead and check out this video to learn a little bit more. Today, we are going to be talking about having a brand new mind. <laughs> Sounds fun. If you can stand up here and look in these beads. Do you guys see anything written in, in written down there? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Can't see through those beads, can you? Mm -hmm. what, can you reach in there and grab a card and see what it says? Never stop growing in wisdom. Wisdom is worth searching for. Okay, wisdom is worth searching for. What does yours say, Abram? I haven't, you know what read, I haven't read all my reading lessons yet. Okay, Never that's okay. Never stop growing in wisdom. Never stop growing in wisdom. What, what's the one word that's in all of these cards? Wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is worth searching for. Yep, yeah, just like you've been searching. See, you, you just been searching for something, and that was wisdom. Okay, now I want you to put them back in. When we put them back in there, we can't see. So how do you think we get wisdom? Where do you think wisdom comes from? Do you have any ideas? Trusting God. From trusting God? Absolutely. How do we learn what God wants us to do? What's in here? The Bible is God's, God's word. God's word. Exactly. Good job, Abram. That's exactly right. Okay, but now let's see what happens. I'm gonna pour some Bye. more water. I'm gonna pour some more water in here, okay? And there's something that's supposed to happen when I pour water in you here. You can see them. Oh, oh, I gotta keep it in the box though. Oh. You can see them. You can't see the water beads, but you can see the <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Okay, now what happened? It changed. It did. And now we can see the cards. And now you can see what's on the cards, can't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what truth does. When you have truth, it makes it easier to see wisdom. Let's talk about a couple, a couple scenarios, a couple activities where you might need to have some wisdom, okay? You're upset with your brother for taking the last snack from the pantry and you yell at him. Does that sound like a wise thing to do? No. No? He's just getting a snack. He's yeah. hungry. What should you do? <gasps> Yeah, what? You should just tell your mom that we should just go buy more snacks because your brother got the last one. What do you think? Asking nicely? 
Asking nicely for him to share? Good answer. Okay, let's try another thing. You're playing on the playground at school with your friends, and they start teasing a kid who's different than you. Okay. And your friends start saying mean things about that person and start teasing that person. Do you think, um, would it be a good idea if you started playing with that kid? And maybe became their friend? Mm -hmm. It would be a wise thing to do, wouldn't it? I think that's something Jesus would want you to do. Does that sound like a wise thing to do? Yeah. Yeah? Do you think so, Herb? Yep. Okay, let's say you went to the nature park and you were with your friends and there's a creek in the nature park and your friends say, hey, let's go down to the creek. You know, there's some really cool animals. Maybe there's some beavers down there oh, or, you know, something like that. You told your mom you'd be home at a certain time it's getting close to that time, so you head home. Does that sound wise? Not yes. Wise. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sounds super wise, because if you do it over time, they might get worried about you, like if a stranger took you or something. Or maybe a bear eated you. Yeah. <laughs> but if you come home very late and yeah. it, um, doesn't uh, come on time, they might never let you do it again. Yep, yep, and they won't let you hang out with your friends because they don't trust you. I have a bunch of play dates with my friends. I had one yesterday. Oh, neat. Was it with someone from school? Yeah. She oh. lives like close by, so I just ran my back to her house because it's like six seconds away. <laughs> oh, good. So the more time we spend praying to Jesus and reading his word, learning in church, those are all ways to get wise and, and have wisdom. Bubbly. Your hands are bubbly. That's exactly right. Okay, you guys have been good listeners. You want to play in the bubbles some more? Grabbed a bunch of them. You grabbed a bunch of them. Like All right. This much. Take the other one already. You can take one. Okay. <laughs> so remember that we're talking about having our mind renewed by God so that we can see clearly, so that we can think clearly, and so that we can speak clearly, okay? Can I have a bag of these? Okay. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we can get you a bag. I'm not sure. Good morning. That video was a glimpse of what it's like in our elementary small group in Life for Kids. Usually there's a few more kids and a lot more noise. As Logan said, my name is Laura Yulncott, and I'm the children's pastor here at Real Life. Welcome to those that are joining us online. I want to take you back for a moment, but I'll need your participation. Jesus loves me, this I know. I Remember when you first heard that song or where you were? That song takes me back to my grandmother's house after church as we made lunch, singing songs. It was my grandmother who took us to church as a little girl. It wasn't every week, but it was often as she could. It was where I first learned about Jesus, who he was, what he did for us, and that he loved me. What I learned there was enough to carry me through my younger years. I came from a broken family and a lot of chaos. I didn't know a lot of Bible verses, the books of the Bible, or what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus. But I knew he loved me, he was with me, and that he would always be there. This knowledge carried me through to 15 when life got complicated. I felt unseen, unheard, and it seemed like no one understood me. To get away from it at all, I ran away. It was a year later that I accepted Christ and was baptized. It was through that experience my passion for children grew. My heart for children is to make sure they are seen, heard, and understood. Jesus calls the little children to him. He sees them, hears them, and understands them. 
I'm going to have Ethan come up and say a Bible verse for us. Come up. Here you go. Matthew 19, 13, 14, 13 through 14. Then people brought the little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But then the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Thank you. Good job. I see the little kids on Sunday run up to the swinging doors, eager to get to their classrooms, to see their leaders, and be with their friends and learn about Jesus. It's so cute to see them with their hands on the doors, swinging doors, just trying to peer over on their tiptoes. Parents have shared with me how their children can't wait for children's church. Children can teach us just as much as we teach them. In small groups, we dive deeper into the lesson for the week. It's where questions are asked, discussions are had, and discoveries are made of who Jesus is. Elementary is the time that children are figuring out their faith. It's through their questions and perspectives that the leaders learn something from the kids. I had a leader tell me once after serving in a classroom that she had heard the Bible story many times but hadn't thought of it in that way. Statistics show that 85% 85% of people that come to Christ do so before the age of 15, 18, sorry. 15% said they accepted Christ before age 6. 32% before, between the ages of 7 and 11. That's our elementary ages. And 36% between the ages of 12 and 19. That's our middle school and high school. After 19, the percentage drops to 16%. Children and youth ministry is critical during this stage of life. Children aren't the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today and tomorrow. They make a difference now. Give and lead today. They pray big prayers, ask big questions, and bring people to Jesus. As you walked in this morning, you've seen kids and youth at the front doors and throughout the lobby. They're a little more visible this week, but kids and youth serve every week, from coffee, production, worship, and Life for Kids. Life for Kids welcomes LITs in the ministry. LITs are leaders in training. They are students 7th through 12th grade. Over the summer, they were the reason we had Life for Kids. Our LITs outnumbered the adults, but don't get alarmed, we had an adult in every classroom. But it was our LITs that stepped up. They helped teach lessons, lead activities and discussions, or sat with a child because they were nervous. They were making a difference now. Ethan and Emma often come with their mom, Katie, to help set up curriculum. They both attend elementary classes on Sunday. On Easter, they signed up to be in a classroom, but Ethan asked if he could be in his own classroom. After the service, the leader shared how Ethan has a passion for serving and did a great job. A couple weeks ago, Katie was serving in a classroom with Emma. After service, Emma came out and asked if she could help again. I said, yeah, you can stay. She turned around and went back down the hallway, ready to serve another service. They are making a difference now and leading today. I had another leader that asked if her grandkids, kids who were visiting, could help in the classroom for a service. I said, absolutely. I later asked if they enjoyed it, and she said they had a great time and wanted to come back. These kids that don't go to church, but felt seen and welcomed. Six years ago, I was asked to be a leader at Life for Kids camp. I had 10 girls in my cabin. Girls had a great time. But I had moments when I thought, what was I thinking? I don't know what I'm doing. They aren't learning anything. I'm failing. I went back the next year and asked for the same group of girls. I questioned again whether I was making a difference. Each year I have moved up with the girls. I even took them camping during COVID when camp was canceled. Six years ago, I took a risk. I stepped out of my comfort zone and and invested in a group of girls. In June, I got the privilege of having one of those girls serve as an LIT at camp. Several of those girls are serving in life for kids. They are making a difference now and leading today. Emma? There you go. 
Luke 18, 16. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Good job. We are the most important ministry that our church has. We set the foundation, plant the seeds, and turn the soil of faith in these children. We see, hear, and do our best to understand the children in our ministry. In a survey, it was said, who, it was asked, who helped you come to Christ? 28% said the children's ministry or leader. 50% said that their parents helped them come to Christ. Parents, grandparents, and foster families. Remember that in Jesus, you have what you need, but we are help, here to help you live and walk it out. What are you actively doing for the next generation? What are you doing to see, hear, and understand them? Children aren't the church of tomorrow. They are the, the church of today and tomorrow. They can make a difference now, give and lead today. They pray big prayers, ask big questions, and bring people to Jesus. I'll leave you with this one last thought. What is the faith of the next generation worth? Let me say it again. What is the faith of the next generation worth? We have a video with former Lifer kids that are now in Lifer youth. Take a look. What is your favorite part of youth group and small groups? For me, it's the community because it's like a... It's like a friend group that's not like one that you'd see at school. What about you, Haley? Oh, the tables have turned. Uh, my favorite part is getting to show you guys what I have learned and then learning from you guys. The discipleship. Ready for the next question. What is one way your leaders have helped you? Or a leader has helped you? Um, my leader, uh, she uh, like sought out um, fellowship with me. She asked me to coffee um, and she was willing to study the Bible with me. What is the most memorable thing that has happened to you at Life for You? For me, it's camp. And uh, it's just a overall really fun experience. For me, it's also camp and like making the rooms in the cabins look as terrifying as possible. Mine was also camp, just the experience in general and getting like closer to God and stuff like that was like really memorable. Those are some good memories. Um, how has Life for Youth helped you grow? Um, personally, I think it's helped me develop my leadership. I'm not very good with leading people who are my age. Um, so like my fellow high schoolers, but I developed that skill at youth group. I wasn't a very social person before Life for Youth, really. When um, I think Emmy invited me, I was afraid that people were going to judge me. And like, like um, based on like the kind of clothes that I wore or just, um, just on anything, it is a lot different now. Um, I'm older, I'm kind of used to it and in the groove of things. Um, if you had to describe Life for Youth in one word, what would it be? Cool, awesome, fun, all one word. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating, but okay. <laughs> That's like a really hard question. <laughs> Insert Jeopardy music here. No, 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 what, about no, you? No. what about you, Haley? My goodness, the tables are just keep turning. One word to describe life or youth. I'm going to go with something Ronan said earlier, and I'm going to say community. If you could say anything to the community of Real Life on the Palouse, our church, what would you say to them? Life or youth is like a safe place, and it's like really fun to, and like to go out there and meet new people that won't like judge you in any way, and it's just really fun, and it's a good experience. What um, issues or struggles um, or battles do you feel like kids at your age, youth, um, face today or at your schools? Personally, I feel like there's a lot of kind of double standard for youth. 
there's not a whole lot of expected out of us because we're young or whatever, but at the same time, they expect you to be an adult, but they don't treat you like one. And they don't give you the opportunity to show that you could be one. And um, just, I feel like the biggest thing is that we get ignored because of our age. This is like a thing that I've found in like most situations where um, parents or like adults don't think like sometimes they're like, oh, you're too young to be depressed or have anxiety or anything like that. But like you can really start at almost any age. What would you say is something that you've learned um, about your struggles or how God has spoken into them, your relationship with God over this past year being in life for youth? Mine is definitely you are not alone in any way, shape, or form. Even if you have nobody on earth next to you in that moment or whatever, God has never left you and never will. Meanwhile. So I think that's something I've learned, that it's okay to ask questions. Goodness, Ronan. I'm sorry, that's, Gosh, that's, Ronan. that's Way to ruin the moment. That's if you could choose to do one thing in our church to make it more friendly for people your age, what would you do? Or what would you encourage the adults um, who are on staff at our church to do? Personally, it's just keep doing what they're doing. I think they have a really great system going on. Like I said, it's a really great community. And I think uh, they replicate that very well in Life for Youth. Yeah, I agree with that. Like, they don't let your age necessarily like, prevent you from serving in the church. Like, I did coffee since I was like nine for a long time and it didn't matter that I was nine. I would probably just make um, um, like the big youth gathering like tonight longer. <laughs> make it go to like ten. Um, no thank you. No. <laughs> but okay. I would say bring back the donuts we had. That's like that, that is the one thing. Yes. I, I agree. I miss I them agree. so hey, much. Let's agree. Start a we need them donuts back. Donuts in the morning. Okay, so the youth want donuts. That is what I'm hearing. Yes, we yes. do. Actually, yes. the youth can pay for the donuts. <laughs> the youth can pay for the donuts with their hard-earned money on They're the coffee hard-earned. team and the worship team. Yes. Okay, yes. I say that real life's pretty hip and happening. Are we Don't good? Say that. No, Haley. Discrimination. Um, <laughs> discrimination. Stop. This is what I said. This was what I was talking about when I was at 40 years old. No. Yes, Just Dad. Go back to your generation. Okay. I will see you in the early 2000s, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. That was... I, I love that video so much. Um, and apparently there's some donuts that I need to bring back or something. So, <laughs> um, every single one of those kids, um, if you see them today um, in the hall, if you see them in the lobby, if you just give them a pat back, tell them how proud I am of them. Because every single one of those kids was brave enough uh, to get up on this very stage um, and answer some questions that were, were pretty hard hitting. So I don't, I don't know if you guys remember, um, but my name is Logan Steinbaugh. I have the amazing honor of being the youth pastor here at Real Life on the Palouse. Um, I don't, I don't know about you, but when I was in middle school, even in high school, I don't know if I would have been able to do that. That would have been terrifying to me to sit down and be like, we're going to ask you some very pointed questions and everyone's going to see it. And I would have been like, okay. (laughs) But there was something that Lily said in that video that I think really, really well sums up the idea of the next generation in our church. Um, As I was watching through it, it just kept sticking in my mind over and over again. She said that there's um, a bit of a double standard for youth. There's this idea that um, there isn't much expected of them because they're young, but at the same time, we expect them as a community, as a society, as a culture, as a church, we expect them to be more. We don't expect very much of them, but we also expect them to be more. And I think I know the reason why that is. Uh, For every single one of you that joined us here today, including all of you that joined us online, um, you should all be very, very well acquainted with the struggles of youth. If you are a human being who is alive and breathing, um, who is hearing what I'm saying, then at some point you either were a teenager, you are a teenager, or you will be a teenager. It is a universal thing. It is something that we all struggle with, something that we've all known. The endearing awkwardness of adolescence is something that escapes no man or woman. (laughs) Every single one of us knows what it's like to be young. And we all know what it's like to try and figure out who we are, while at the same time trying to figure out the intricacies of this great big world around us. And that makes 
each other task very difficult when you're trying to find out who you are and who the world is at the same time. And because of that, I've noticed that we tend to express sort of low expectations for young people, low expectations for middle schoolers, for high schoolers, because we expect them to maybe not be able to reach whatever standards that we set for them. When most of us think back to our adolescent years, um, if you're anything like me, um, you probably don't look at them through rose-colored glasses, because I certainly know that I don't. We look back at them and we remember how naive we were about the world. We think back to the immaturity when we think of those actions that we did in our youth compared to now as we're older. We think back to how much we had to learn ahead of us in our formative years. When most of us look back at our adolescence, I don't know about you guys, but that's typically what I think of. But in reality, this is in stark contrast to the way that God views the world. God looks at young people in a very, very different light. He has for the entirety of human history all throughout God's stories, all throughout the scriptures, over and over and over again, he has been crying out that youth are a very, very, very important part of his kingdom. For as long as humanity has existed, God has been using young people to make a difference. When we're reminded of the angst of our youth that I just described, oftentimes we think of it in a negative light. We think of it as something that is bad, something that we shouldn't be associated with. But God has shown us all throughout history that that is the total opposite of what he is trying to convey. Rather, if we were to look at those same things that we would view as negative in God's light, it completely turns it on its head. See, God tends to see those who are naive rather as those who have the spark of change in their culture and in their worlds for something great. Uh, I always think of uh, the great King David. If you're familiar with the Bible or the Old Testament at all, you may be familiar with the great King David. There are so many stories about this man. Um, he wrote a good chunk of the Psalms. He was a very, very influential king and a very, very influential man. But in the book of Samuel, long before he becomes the great King David, we find just a boy, just a kid, a shepherd out in the field, and when David was naive in the way that he viewed the world, God used him to challenge Goliath and to eventually take on a very cruel and brutal ruler. That was long before he was ever the great King David. It was when he was just a young kid, a naive one at that. When God sees those who are immature, rather he tends to see those who are ripe for growth opportunities, both for themselves and for others. Uh, I'm reminded in the book of Genesis, uh, if you're familiar at all with the story of Joseph, um, Joseph, it, from like chapter 37 on in the book of Genesis, his story is one that is influential in our culture, in our minds, in our churches. But the story starts out by describing Joseph as a young man of the age of 17. I cannot find a better description for youth than a 17-year-old kid. And when we find Joseph there, we see that God was able to use the immature way that he treated others and the immature way that he viewed himself and the world around himself as a catalyst to save not just his own family, but the entire kingdom of Egypt. All because God looked at this young 17-year-old man and thought, I can do something with this immature way that he looks at the world. God sees those who seemingly have much to learn rather as people with great lessons to teach others. Uh, I think of the biblical story of Daniel in the book of Daniel, if you've ever div uh, dove into that book, you find a young man who is living in a bubble. Um, he is living in the city of Jerusalem. He has never known life outside of his own mindset, outside of his own culture, outside of his own faith and people who express the same faith as him. And suddenly in the book of Daniel, his entire life is thrown up into chaos when his entire world is invaded by the kingdom of Babylon. And for the very first time, Daniel had to look at the world in a way that he wasn't expected to. And God took this man who had never experienced life outside of his own little bubble, and he used him to stand up against the tyrannical might of a godless kingdom. God sees the next generation, and he doesn't see kids that just need to do some growing. When God sees the next generation, he sees radical potential for the kingdom of heaven. But the reality is, is that we as a culture don't really look at it these, this way. We tend to look at these world changers, as God describes them, as people who are simply not yet adults. That makes me so sad. See, we're, I've learned as I've kind of been paying attention and, and watching the way that we interact with 
with middle schoolers and high schoolers and even college students, even the way that I've interacted with them, a lot of times we look at them and we are comfortable with simply filling their heads with rote knowledge about God rather than trying to ask and seek how we can help them live that out. As I was kind of digging into this, I came across some current statistics that they scare me. Uh, Current statistics tell us that six out of every 10 young believers will leave the church and their faith altogether by the time they either graduate high school or move out from their childhood home. And the thing that I find so scary about that is that number is steadily on the rise. It's only been going up. And the hard truth is that there will be a day when the students that we so desperately are trying to prepare for if there are their future will find themselves in situations where they're not around their parents. They're not around their leaders. They are not around their pastors. And when that time comes, I guarantee you that knowing all of the books of the Old Testament in order is only going to be of so much use. Rather, we need to try and prepare them by living out radical discipleship and kingdom work with them. But what does that look like? We talk about that a lot. We say, do life with each other. We say that we need to live out discipleship. But what does that look like? It's something that I've wrestled with a lot. Um, But I think I have an answer because it's something that was modeled for me. It's something that I had the chance of someone to pour into my life. Um, Some of the Life for Youth in here may actually know this story because I've shared it at youth group before. Uh, But when I was in middle school and high school, um, I attended a church that was a little bit different than real life. It was much smaller, uh, maybe like 125, 150 people, maybe in total, coming on a good Sunday. My youth group was like 10 to 15 kids on a good Wednesday. It wasn't very big. Um, And so because of that, everyone knew everyone And I remember I was uh, 14 years old and my youth group decided to go on this conference, this trip to the Oregon coast. And uh, one evening, after all of the students had fallen asleep, my leaders congregated together without our knowledge. Um, They all got together in the dead of night long after we had fallen asleep and they got together and they discussed how they could best encourage us, how they could best um, give every single one of us as the next generation a chance to live out this discipleship and this kingdom work. And what they did was they sat down and they discussed with each other and they went through every single kid in our youth group and they thought, what is a verse that we could give these kids that right now where we know that they are at in their lives that could be encouraging to them, that could build them up, that could be something that could be a catalyst to help them find further growth in the future. And the following morning I woke up and I found this piece of paper. Um, it's, it's small because it's folded up, um, but inside is just a very simple verse. They, apparently they sat down and they thought, what does Logan need to hear? Um, and they came up with the verse, 1 Timothy 4.12. Uh, I believe we can have a picture up of this up on the screen. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but rather set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And looking at this now, Uh, you can kind of see it's tattered. It is worn. Uh, It is creased and crumpled and ripped. Uh, It is this really beautiful like brown papyrus color, but uh, I hate to break it to you guys, this used to just be plain white printer paper. (laughs) But I've held on to it for so long. And it's been either in my wallet or in my pocket or in the dash of my car. And for years and years and years, I'm now a grown man, I'm married, I have an apartment, I pay taxes, but I still have this piece of paper because it meant so much to me. And it wasn't like waking up and getting this little piece of paper with this one specific verse was this groundbreaking moment that changed my life and sent me on this path. But rather it was one action combined with countless others that set me on a path to a faith that I could never have possibly imagined. And the best part of all of this was that the people that invested and poured into me, the people that sat down and sacrificed their time, they weren't official pastors. They didn't have fancy titles from churches. They didn't have well-designed lanyards. They didn't have Bible college degrees. They didn't have any of this stuff. Rather, they were contractors and home security workers and janitors, and they were secretaries and nurses and woodworkers. They were just people that cared. They, were, they weren't what I would call traditionally pastors, but they were pastors to me. They were men and women who devoted their time and their energy and their patience so that I could see the radical love of Jesus Christ. 
When I look at this paper, I don't just see a piece of paper. I see people who were willing to be inconvenienced for me. We here at Real Life, we're really passionate about the next generation of the church because that is exactly what they are. They are the next ones in line. So I would implore you to ask yourself, in what ways are you devoting your time, your patience, your energy, as a parent, as a role model, as fill in the blank, whatever space you have in your life? And students, I would ask you to ask yourself the same. In what ways am I letting these words transform me? How am I trying to set an example for other believers in the way that I speak, in the way that I live, in my faith and my righteousness lived out? Are you trying to live out these things or rather are you creating roadblocks for the people around you that are trying to build you up and show you the love of Jesus? The next generation may be the future of the church, but they're here and they're here now. And so just like Laura asked you guys earlier, I want to ask you a question. What's the faith of the next generation worth to you? Uh, but I kind of want to put my money where my mouth is. So I have a friend I want to introduce you guys to. His name is Max. I wonder where he is. Come on out, Max. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, guys. This is Max. Uh, he is a member of Life for Youth. He's probably one of the smartest kids I think I've ever met in my life. Um, and he's going to be leading us um, in communion here in a moment. But I wanted to ask you, um, when we kind of sat down and we're talking about this, I asked you, what was something that you would want to share with the congregation if you ever got the chance? Well, so what I kind of wanted to share was just whenever you guys sit down with one of us and just kind of talk with us about the Bible or just spend, you know, even 20 minutes of your day just hanging out with us, building a relationship, it's really meaningful. Mm-hmm. I have a really good story from when I went to a church camp where I just had one of my leaders who noticed that every day I would just go over, grab a drink, drink, and then go just read my Bible. And he kind of went over to me one day, and we just went through a book together. And it was really powerful and really cool. And honestly, it's just so valuable when you guys show that you really care about us, and it really inspires us to keep going. I love that. Um, Max is going to lead you guys in communion, but seriously, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to my, my friend here. So go ahead, take it away. All right. So as we go into communion, just a reminder that we have an open table. So as long as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are more than welcome to just attend. It doesn't matter if this is your first time here or your thousandth, anyone's welcome to take communion. Now, if you forgot to grab your communion elements this morning, just go ahead and raise your hand. We'll have ushers coming around in just a minute or two. They'll get you what you need. So, on the, lo- on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread on- and broke it, saying, this is my body, take and eat. And whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember. He also said, sorry, Later, after the supper, he took a cup, saying, this is my blood. And whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim, sorry, this is a new covenant in my blood. And whenever you drink this blood, (laughs) this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink. I just kind of want to focus in on that last line of the verse that we use. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so I really just hope that as we go through our next week, we would continue to proclaim that to everyone around us, to the youth, to anyone. Just keep working hard, keep standing tall. And now let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for just everything that you've done for us today, giving us this time, this bread, this wine. Just thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. I pray that you would help us to stand firm in the faith and go forth to minister and disciple to those around us, and that you would help us to see the next generation and how to work with them. Amen.